My Weird Writing Tips by Dan Gutman. Pictures by Jim Pellot. My Little Secret. Here's a trick I use to improve my writing. I'm pretty sure I invented it. Maybe not. In any case, I never heard of anybody else who uses it. I shouldn't be revealing the secret to you because once everybody finds out, any dumbhead will be able to do what I do. But I'm going to tell you anyway because this book is dedicated to you, and you seem like a good kid. So keep it to yourself, okay? I've got enough competition as it is. Here's the trick: after you finish your first draft. Let it sit there and age for a while, a couple of days at least. It will fade just a little bit in your memory. Next, pick it up again and read it out loud, while you pretend to be somebody else. It's as simple as that. Pretend to be your teacher, a parent, your best friend, or a complete stranger. When you read the words out loud and pretend to be somebody else, it's almost like you're reading those words through someone else's eyes. You'll see the mistakes you made the first time. You'll see where you can make the writing better, clearer, and sharper. You can pretend to be me, Arlo. Ugh, disgusting. Yes, people may think you're crazy while you're reading out loud, but maybe they think that anyway. As you read it out loud, the words should flow smoothly in your mind. One word should lead naturally to the next one. One sentence should lead to the next one. One paragraph should lead to the next one. If the words don't sound right in your mind. They're not right. Make some changes so the whole thing flows. My goal is to write books that flow so smoothly that after two hours you'll look up and think, "Wow, that didn't even feel like I was reading. I felt like I was watching a movie in my head." That's my secret. Now rip this book into a million little pieces so nobody else finds out. Well, don't rip it into a million pieces. If you bought the ebook version, that would be weird. A good style should show no signs of effort. What is written should seem a happy accident. W. Somerset, Mom. More secret tips? Shh! Don't tell anyone. Nobody gets it exactly right the first time. Every good story goes through at least one round of changes and corrections. Here are a few things to think about while you're writing and revising your story. Revising your story. Break it up. When I read essays written by kids, there's one problem that jumps out over and over again. You don't use paragraphs. I don't get it. Some of my best friends are paragraphs. They're harmless. In fact, they add a lot to your writing by spacing out your thoughts. So break it up. Look for natural places where the topic changes even slightly. Bam! Put a new paragraph right there. Your paragraphs don't have to be long. They can even be one sentence. Like this. Here's a paragraph right here. A paragraph can even be one word long. See, but don't overdo it, okay? It would be obnoxious to write paragraphs like this. The important thing is, a paragraph should not be a full page or longer, unless, of course, you want to see your reader's head explode. If you reread your work, you will find on rereading 
that a great deal of repetition can be avoided by rereading and editing. William Sapphire. Are you allergic? Some kids appear to be allergic to periods. I can't think of any other reason why they refuse to use them. See if you enjoy reading this. Jimmy and I went to the store and got some Slim Jims, and then we came home and hung out in my basement, and then we played some video games and did our homework, and this guy rang the bell and tried to get us to donate money for some charity, and then his mom called and said he had to come home, so he went home, and that was pretty much what happened today. Or would you rather read this? Jimmy and I went to the store. We got some Slim Jims, and then we came home and hung out in my basement. We played some video games, and then we did our homework. This guy rang the bell and tried to get us to donate money for some charity. Jimmy's mom called and said he had to come home. So he went home. That was pretty much what happened today. Admittedly, neither of those paragraphs is going to win the Nobel Prize or anything. That's a prize they give out to people who don't have bells. But at least the second one is readable. It was broken down into short, simple, easy-to-read chunks. The first one is a long, run-on sentence. There's no extra charge for using periods, folks. So use them. Put one thought in each sentence, not ten. Run-on sentences are boring. How not to bore people to death? If I ask a hundred reluctant readers why they don't like to read, almost all of them will reply, because it's boring. People get bored incredibly easy. I once fell asleep while watching one of the Mission Impossible movies. You've got to be really easily bored for that to happen. You don't want to bore anybody with your writing, so how can you avoid that? Trim the fat. Did you ever hear the expression "less is more"? You may think you're fooling your teacher by using a page and a half to describe the beautiful sunset you witnessed on your summer vacation. Look, I hate to tell you this, but nobody cares. Your teacher isn't going to give you an A because you wrote something that was twice as long as what the kid sitting next to you wrote. Your teacher has twenty-five or thirty of these papers to read. She doesn't want to go home after school and spend hours reading a page and a half about your sunset. She wants to go to her aerobics class. She wants to watch a movie on HBO. She wants to work on her stamp collection. Does anybody still collect stamps? Anyway, you're going to put your teacher to sleep if you go on for page after page describing a sunset, or what somebody's face looks like, or the way somebody holds an umbrella. Move it along. Get to the point. You don't want your readers to die from old age while they're reading your story. Look over the first draft of something you've written. Now see how many words you can cut out while still keeping the meaning. For every word you can get rid of, cheat yourself to an M and M. No fair putting in extra words so you can cut them out later and get more M and Ms. If that doesn't work, pretend there's an egg shortage. Pretend each word costs you a dollar. Cut, cut, cut. Kill the adjectives. An adjective is a word that describes a noun, like big describes whale. But all whales are big, so there's no need to write big whale. Some people will tell you that you should pile on the adjectives to make your story more vivid or simply longer. Well, how does this sound? The tall, blonde, handsome, tired, gawky ten-year-old boy was wearing a new bright red flannel shirt as he walked down the dark, forbidding cobblestone street. Zzzz. Oh, sorry, I dozed off there for a moment.
Look, who cares what the kid was wearing? What difference does it make? What kind of stones were in the street? Get rid of that boarding stuff. Get that kid to wherever it is he's going, have something cool happen there, and move the story along. You don't have to mention every detail along the way. Readers have imaginations. Let them use them. Elmore Leonard, a very famous author for adults, uses the word hoop to doodle to describe all the boring stuff that is found in so many books. As Leonard puts it, I try to leave out the parts that readers tend to skip. You don't want to read hoop to doodle, so don't write hoop to doodle. I could go on and on talking about this subject, but I would be doing exactly what I've been telling you not to do. I think you get the point with three words. Trim the fat. As to the adjective, when in doubt, check it out. Mark Twain. A few words about reading. I've been telling you that writing should be simple to the point and effortless to read. But not all books are like that. In fact, many of the books you may have to read for school are just the opposite. If you struggle to read a book, it doesn't mean you're dumb or a poor reader. It just means that book is intended for a different kind of person. Some people like to read stories that are very complicated, with long passages of word pictures describing the way people look, the way a flower smells, or what the weather is like. Other people prefer stories that get straight to the action and leave the rest to the reader's imagination. As they say, different strokes for different folks. Never use a long word when a diminutive one will do. William Sapphire Why does he say diminutive when he could just say short? Dialogue, a fancy word for talking. People like to talk, said Andrea Young, this annoying girl with curly brown hair. And readers like to read about characters talking. Why do you think that is, said her equally annoying crybaby friend Emily. Well, said Andrea, dialogue livens up the story. And it also breaks up the text on the page with a little white space. So I should try to have some dialogue in my story, said Emily. Sure, said Andrea. That is, if the characters have anything worth saying. Set off dialogue using quotation marks. Use commas between the quotation marks and the part about who is doing the talking. I'm awesome. I said. He said, she said, they said, you said, we said. Did you notice in that last section that the word said was used every time Andrea or Emily said something? The problem is that said gets to be boring after reading it a few times in a row. You don't always have to use that word. There are plenty of other ways to say said, and they're more descriptive. You'll find a lot more if you go online and search for other ways to say said. But here are some examples. Added. Admitted. Agreed. Announced. Argued. Asked. Babbled. Barked. Begged. Bellowed. Boasted. Bragged. Called. Commented. Cried. Declared. Drolled. Exclaimed. Explained, gasped, growled, grumbled, grunted, hollered, insisted, joked, mumbled, muttered, pleaded, proclaimed, quipped, remarked, replied, responded, roared, shouted, sighed, snapped, sputtered, stammered, suggested, whispered, yelled. Nonfiction, keeping it real. So far, we've been talking about writing fiction, but your teacher may ask you to write a nonfiction essay about something you're studying in class. Writing nonfiction is different from writing fiction, of course. You can't just make up any old crazy stuff in your head. 
You've got to stick with the facts. But there aren't a lot of similarities, too. You still want to tell a story in nonfiction. You're just telling a true story. Let's say your topic is alligators. The first step should be to gather a bunch of facts. Try to find out everything you can about alligators. See if there are any books about them in your school library or the public library. Check the encyclopedia. Go online and search for alligators. Try to find a movie about alligators. While you're looking at all this material, make a note of any fact about alligators that captures your interest. If it interests you, it will probably be interesting to other people too. When I'm researching a book, I jot down interesting facts on 3 by 5 inch index cards. One note on each card. I may have a stack of 200 cards by the time I'm finished researching. You may want to try this card system with your writing, too. It's a really simple way to organize your information. When you feel that you've gathered enough information, the next step is to organize it. Read through your cards one by one, sorting the cards into groups that seem to go together. Start to make smaller piles of cards on the floor. You might have a pile of cards about what alligators eat, a pile about where they live, a pile about what they look like, and so on. Basically, you're breaking a big topic, alligators, and breaking it down into smaller pieces. Next, take those piles and put them into an order that tells a story, a true story, about alligators. Explain where they live, what they look like, how they behave, what they eat, and so on. Just like in a fiction story, you still want to start with a bang to grab the reader's attention. Maybe there was a famous alligator attack? You still want to break the story up into lots of sentences and paragraphs. You still want to cut the hoop to doodle. And of course, you still need to rewrite the story to make it as good as it can be. Getting published. I know what you're thinking. You wrote a story. You think it's pretty good. Now you want to send it to me so I can help you get it published. No, don't. I'm not a publisher. But the good news is that there are lots of places, especially online, that accept writing by kids. The following list includes just a few. Your teacher or librarian may be able to help you find more. Stone Soup, a print and web magazine written by kids from 8 to 13. Diary Land, create your own diary. The Telling Room, a program dedicated to young writers to honor the act of storytelling. Tick-a-talk, enables kids to create their own books online, including pictures, and actually have them printed and mailed to them.